strikes and fades quickly back into the shadows of his dark world. And then, the man from Scotland Yard, the relentless, dangerous pursuit. When man hunts man. Now, with Ted DeCorsia starred as the famous inspector Peter Black of Scotland Yard, we bring you tonight's story of violence and murder. Three for all. Sometime, somewhere, somehow, every man touches another and leaves a scar. A word is said, a deed is done, and a mortal hate is planted. And sometimes that hate can become death, violent death, murder. Then a man must be hunted. A man must be stalked. Through a city's crowd, through the sunlit noon, through the twilight shadows, through a thousand places. And finally, a man must be caught. Pursuit. At Scotland Yard, that's our job. Inspector Black? Yes, Sergeant. Chief Inspector Harkness wants to see you. He said, please hurry. Oh, thank you, Marvin, right away. No. Yeah. Good morning, Black. Come in, come in. Sit down. Uh, thank you. Sergeant Moffat made it sound very urgent, sir. Did he? May or may not be. I want your opinion on it. On what, sir? In this note. Came in this morning's mail. It's made up of letters clipped from a newspaper. The thing was addressed to me, and it says, A man, Melville Rogers, will be found dead today with a knife in him. He will be dead. May I see it, sir? Well, of course. Have we found a man with a knife in him today, Black? Not yet, sir. We've had many notes of this type before, and nothing has come of them. Uh, however, Black, will you look into it? Of course, sir. Excuse me, Black. Darkness here. What? Yes? Now, give me that address again. Gruber's Tea Shop, 12 Buxton Lane. I have it, thank you. Well, Black? Yes, sir? They have found a man with a knife in him. A man named Melville Rogers. You'll look into it, won't you? All right. All right, you folks. Keep moving about your business. Stand back, please. This way, Inspector. In here, sir. Uh, thank you, Mark. That one's Mrs. Gruber, the proprietor of the restaurant. I see. I shall want to talk to her in a few minutes. The deceased, sir. He was stabbed to death as you see him sitting at this table, looking out of the window. You've established his identification? Yes, sir. Name's Melville Rogers. Lived in Kensington. Known to Mrs. Gruber over there. Had his meals here every day. I see. And uh, who are these other people? Those three? Customers, sir. Dining at the time Mr. Rogers was discovered dead. Mm. Uh, tell me, Moffat, who noticed that he was dead? Mrs. Gruber, one of the customers? This one. Oh, I did, sir. Oh, I did all right. And who are you? Uh, Charles Bennett, sir. Two N's and one T. I live in Quimby Street nearby. Uh, did you get the name, sir? Charles Bennett. Yes, yes, Charles Bennett. Uh, tell me, Mr. Bennett, how did you happen to discover this man was dead? Well, I'm not a physician, sir, but that knife sticking in his side, and he wasn't breathing, sir. Yes. No, I'm not a physician, but there are ways to tell when a man's dead. Naturally. You noticed this as soon as you came into the restaurant? Oh, no, sir. When I came in, the place was crowded. Not a table. So I waited. Even when there was a place to sit, I waited. You might wonder why I did that, sir. Yes, I might. Well, you've noticed I have a withered arm. Yes, I had. I don't hide it very well, do I? Oh, it's not that I'm ashamed. It's not that at all. But... You were waiting for this particular table. Why? Because, uh, well, it's obvious. It's the only table near the window. So I might sit and none of the other customers would notice me. My arms, sir. What do you do for a living, Mr. Bennett? Not much I can do. Odd jobs, better newspapers, what one you might say for a wage. But sometimes I do a painting job on a house. But you see, sir, it's my arm, it's withered. There's not much a man can do with an arm, sir. And so it went. The routine questions and answers. The peering in upon a handful of lives which had been thrown hard against violence. 
the important and impersonal data which would head a new file at Scotland Yard labeled Melville Rogers, Death by Murder. Melville Rogers, a recluse, a bachelor, a man who drove a bus from Battersea to Kingston. Not an enemy in the world, his friends said, which, of course, is ridiculous. Telephone for you, sir. Oh, thank you, Sergeant. Who is it? The caller won't say. A matter of urgency, though, it seems. Right. Inspector Black here. Really, now? Who is this? Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Who is this? <laughs> You're looking for me. Who are you? It's difficult to hear. I know. I've arranged it that way. <laughs> oh. Did you find the dead man, Inspector? Did you find Melville Rogers? I killed him. Sergeant Moffat, trace this call. Better was it? Did you ask Clement to trace this call, Inspector? I'll save you the trouble. I'll tell you where I am. Where are you? On Lyle Street, in a pub, the green dot. Yeah, but, but I won't wait. Listen, Inspector. There's a man here. His name is James Campbell. He's looking at me now, and he's smiling. I'm going to stop talking with you. And then I'm going to take a walk with James Campbell. And then I'm going to stick a knife in him. <laughs> Hello? 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 Lyle Street lies across the face of London like an open wound. It is a street that's well known to Scotland Yard. The brownstone buildings that line it present a facade of drab respectability, but within them is all that is depraved and vicious and corrupt. On Lyle Street, the essence of a man is measured in terms of his brutality. Here are the delicate refinements of crime. The long fingernails with razor blades beneath them for the slitting of pockets or of throats. The smirk of death painted on the lips of women. The green dot was no different from other basement pubs on Lyle Street. It had a massive door with a peephole through which a face peered out at you. And then you were permitted to enter because you were known. And because you were known, you were greeted with a bitter silence. Anything we can do for you, Inspector? I'm looking for a man named James Campbell. Do you know him? Now, there's a proper question, Inspector. And I'll give you a proper answer. No, I don't know James Campbell. Is any one of you James Campbell? It would be well to tell me if you are, because a man named James Campbell is going to be murdered. Oh. Now, there's an interesting bit of news, Inspector. And I'm sure all of us here appreciate it. Someone here telephoned me at Scotland Yard. Who was it, Arnold? Here. Now, you know better than to ask me that, Inspector. All sorts of people home to all sorts of places. There's no accounting for tastes, you know. How long is it since you've been in prison, Arnold? A year, two... I don't rightly care to remember unpleasant things of that sort. It could be unpleasant again, Arnold, easily, quite easily. Beg your pardon, Inspector. Yes? There's a phone call for you. For me? Yes, in the, in the booth over there. Oh, thank you. And like I say, Inspector, all sorts of people come to all sorts of places. Black here. Hello, Black Hartness. Uh, yes, sir. I understand you're down there looking for a man named James Campbell. That's right, sir. Well, I had a telephone call just now. A person with a peculiar kind of voice. He said that James Campbell can be found at 12 Clover Crossing West. That's in Soho. Get over there at once. Right, sir. There it is, sir. Here's his room. Mr. Campbell. James Campbell. Door's locked, sir. Yes. Sergeant. Yes, sir. No one 
down here in the sitting room. Ah, ah. Well, there's some more room, sir. Uh, look in that one. And, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Look in the closets. In any place that might be big enough to hold a man's body. Yes, sir. I'll search the bedroom. Steam boiled through the bathroom door, obscuring everything. The whole place was a miasma of white enamel, hazy, drenched with birds of sweat. And in the shower stall, a man, face downward, fully clothed. Blood seeped from a wound in his neck, and mixing with the water washed away. And then I saw it. A wilted piece of paper tacked to the door. A paper on which was glued words cut from a newspaper. Mr. Campbell is dead, Inspector, it said. There have been two. Tomorrow night at eight, there will be a third, it said. The second act of Pursuit will follow in just a moment. But first... The shortest marathon in the world. That's the Arthur Godfrey daytime show on CBS. Every weekday, Monday through Friday, your man Godfrey entertains for 75 whole minutes, an hour and a quarter, and the time speeds by and nothing flat. Give a listen to Arthur Godfrey's daytime show every weekday on most of these same CBS stations. And now, back to the second act of Pursuit. <laughs> Murder is an ultimate, and pursuit is a variation on the theme. But it so happened that this pursuit was in my domain, because all of London is Scotland Yard's domain. And in the morning, when the papers brought the news to London, it was a city which slackened its pace to allow the horror to settle. Horror and fascination. It resolved itself into simple terms. A manhunt. Man the hunted... Man the hunter. And it was the hunted who absorbed the city's imagination. The hunted who had taken special pains to make it known that some obscure lust for violence possessed him and he would kill again this evening at eight. Scotland Yard's part in it was not nearly so spectacular. All we had to do was find a man or a woman. Well, Black, you can't say this murderer hasn't given us fair warning. If you call 24 hours notice fair... Then more than 12 hours of that already run out. I tell you, all of London's aroused about this thing. I know it, sir, but frankly, I don't know how we can stop him. And if we don't, someone who's walking about alive in the noonday sun will be dead by 8 o'clock. Well, you'd better get busy then, man. Oh, good day, Sergeant. Good day, sir. You haven't much time. Get busy, he says. Haven't much time, he says. <laughs> well, what do you have, Moffat? You better have a look for yourself, sir. Here. The life histories of the two murdered men. That is, from what information we've been able to obtain. I see. Yes. The first man who was murdered, Melville Rogers, born in Chichester. The second, James Campbell, born in Guernsey. Mm -hmm. You see, Inspector, their paths never crossed until 1939. And it's the part that's important. Both joined the RAF as ground crewmen in 39. On the same day, trained in the same camp. Now, I haven't had time to get their war record yet, if that's necessary. However, there's this. They were both discharged from the Sheffield barracks near Huntington. Yes, according to this, on the same day. Good work, Sergeant. Thank you, sir. You say Sheffield barracks near Huntington. On the main road, sir, as you approach it from the south. Call them. Tell them I'm on my way. <laughs> Good afternoon, sir. I was told to expect you. Oh, good afternoon, Private. I want to see the service records of two men. Melville Rogers... Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. Service records. Two men. Oh, I'm afraid that's impossible. Did they tell you I'm from Scotland Yard? Hey, but I'm not allowed in those files, sir. Well, who is? Is that Father Private? Uh, Corporal, this gentleman's from Scotland Yard. Oh, interesting, Walt. I'm in a great hurry, Corporal. I need some information. A man's life may depend on it. A man's life, you say? What man? Who is the officer in charge here? I'm in charge temporarily, sir. What do you want? The service records of two men, Melville Rogers and James Campbell. Oh, 
Are they serving in this barracks? Not now. They... Then we wouldn't have such records, sir. I'm sorry. They I'm... received their discharge after the war from this barracks. I see. You see what? Look, you now, you'll have to see the personnel officer through that door, sir. It's Flight Lieutenant Modier you want to see. Thank you. Yes? Lieutenant Modier. Yes? I'm Inspector Peter Black, Scotland Yard. Yes? I must see the service records of two men who were discharged from this barracks. Yes? Melville Rogers and James Campbell, it's urgent. Oh, no, really? It's a matter of life and death. A man's life may depend upon your getting up from that chair, walking over to wherever you have such records on file, pulling them out and handing them to I them. say. Do it. Do it fast. Well, it's quite impossible, you know. I don't know anything of the kind. Well, I was saying such matters must be cleared. S2 must clear it. Intelligence, you know. Files are confidential. Who is the intelligence officer? Major Browning, right down the corridor. The last office on the left. All the way down. Thank you. <laughs> I say, that, 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 that's a good one. <laughs> Just a minute. Uh, uh, the chap standing there wants to see me, I suppose. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. The yes. same to you, Bertie. <laughs> but, yes, what can I do for you, old man? I'm Peter Black, Inspector, Scotland Yard. Uh, have a chair. I, I could ring for tea a little early. Mm -hmm. Oh, is it? What do you say? Uh, no tea, thank you. This is very urgent, Major. Oh, urgent, uh, you say? Good, good. Very good indeed. Uh, What's urgent? A man's life is desperately close to drawing to an end, Major. Violently. A man will be murdered if you don't help him. What man, indeed? Huh? Major, hmm? there isn't that much time. I must have the files on two ex-members of the RAF ground crew. Two men who got their discharge here. James Campbell and Melville Rogers. Mm, uh, familiar names, both of them familiar. Mm. How familiar? Oh, for, for familiar. Huh? How? Hmm? Say something. How are these names familiar? Oh, should be. I court-martialed them myself. Huh? Campbell and Rogers and... Uh, yes, and what the devil was that uh, other fellow's name? Uh, can't think of it, can't we? Well, think of it. You must think of it. Name, name, name. T -t 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 -timothy. T -t 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 Timothy Hearn, N N M I, no middle initial. Timothy Hearn. That's what I want. I won't need the files if you can tell me why you remember them. Oh, well, easy. On, on VE Day, these three rascals stole a play. Mm -hmm. Smith, Smith, absolutely. Celebrating, loaded to the aileron. Stole a Lancaster, flew around, didn't fly badly for, for ground crew men. Ran out of gas, bailed out, plane crashed into a house. Killed a woman. Mrs. Edward Stanley. So that's it. Motive, revenge. You say a Mrs. Stanley was killed? Uh, how about her husband? Can't tell you a thing about her husband. Edward, uh, Edward, his name was Edward Stanley. I tried to find him, make an adjustment, tried everything to find him. Fellow seems to have vanished from the face of the earth. Uncanny, what? Not he? really uncanny, Major. Uh, do you mind if I use your telephone? I can tell you this, though. If you want Timothy Hearn... Look in Cobb Garden. He, a busker there. Can't miss him. Oh, colorful chap. Uh, wears a red polka dot muffler. A colorful chap, yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, do you mind if I use your telephone? Yours, old boy. Uh, operator, this is Inspector Black. Put me through to Scotland Yard. I want to talk with Sergeant Moffat. Hurry. I, I say, old boy, uh, why are you waiting? Would you like to hear the only one, Bertie? Just tell me. It's funny, you know. <laughs> uh, hello, Moffat. Inspector Black speaking. Two things I want you to do. Trace a man named Edward Stanley, whose wife was killed in an airplane accident on V.E. Day. Do you have that? Good. And I want you to keep your eye on a busker named Timothy Hearn. Covent Garden. I'll meet you there. Sergeant Moffat. Hello, sir. Did you find anything on Edward Stanley? Not a thing, sir. There's no trace of it. The busker, Timothy Hearn. He's right over there, sir, entertaining the crowd. A clown dances and sings on a sunlit street. And the grotesque shadows that men again are dead. I watched Timothy Hearn, the busker, perform for the queue waiting outside the theater. He was a little man with a clown's radiant face. He wore a silk polka dot muffler and tied Natalie around his throat. His clothes were frayed, but somehow he managed a kind of regal relevance. Then he passed through the crowd rattling a tambourine. 
Some dropped coins into it. Some didn't. And then he was standing in front of me. Did you like my pantomime, sir? Always aim to please, I do. And you know, I perform for the best I am. It was fine. Here, here Timothy. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. I say, may I ask how you knew my name? It's not often we buskers are given any kind of billing from our beloved public. <laughs> Is there somewhere we could talk? Oh, I'll go on again in a few minutes, sir. Acrobatic dance. Uh, perhaps we could have a nice talk some other time. Good day, sir. I'm Inspector Black, Scotland Yard, Timothy. Oh. <laughs> uh, fellow professional, you might say. We that sort of puts a different light on it. We can talk over here by the vegetable stall, Inspector. Very well. Well, sir, it's true I don't have a performer's permit, but I think a chip's got to do something, you know. Uh, what's the fine, Inspector? You once knew two men named Melville Rogers and John Campbell. It, uh, it was a long time ago, Inspector. I've already done penning for that. Rogers and Campbell were murdered. Did you know that? Yes, I did. How did it affect you that night? After our court martial, we never spoke to each other again. I guess it was the ugly shame of it. Of all of it. Their death, how did it affect you, Timothy? I try not to think about it, sir. Timothy, this is a hard thing to tell a man, but I must. The murderer has established a pattern. I believe you are part of that pattern. Do you mean he wants to kill me, too? But why? I've never harmed anyone. Except... Except... Exactly. Except the woman who was killed in that unfortunate airplane incident. And someone who loved her very much is the man we're looking for. Before he murdered, he sent us a note. Each time there was a note announcing his victim's death. He announced yours would take place at eight tonight. What? And that doesn't give us much time, me or you. What shall I do, Inspector? Actually, there's nothing for you to do. You're to act as you always act. One of our men will be with you all the time. You won't see him, and you're not to look for him. But I want you in your own home before eight tonight. Before eight? Right, Inspector. I say, you catch him before... before we'll I'm... do our best, Timothy. I promise you, we'll do our best. There was no turning back now. I had made a choice and accepted a responsibility. And if I were wrong, I was offering up a frightened busker named Timothy Ahern as a sacrifice to a madman. It was a setting for murder. The background was precise. A dismal corner where Marleybone Road crosses Oxford Street, damp beneath an early evening drizzle where the wetness had spread the reflection from the street lamps into a yellow film. A corner where Timothy Hearn lived. A corner of shadows and silence. At seven, a police cordon was lined around the block. A few minutes before eight, I was standing in the doorway next door to Timothy's, waiting. Inspector. Yes, yes, Sergeant. Everything's ready. Good. All the intersections covered? Yes, sir. No one can possibly get through. Except the busker, except Timothy Hearn and whoever might be following him, if it's a stranger. Exactly, sir. All right, off the street now, Sergeant, in this doorway with me. Yes, sir. Sergeant. Sir? The underground entrance. Look at it. Oh, I think so, sir. The busker. Yes. On time. Right on time. What? He seems to be drunk, sir. He's not drunk. Let's go. Timothy! Timothy Hearn! Tip. Oh, Inspector. Dead. Timothy Hearn, busker, dead. And it was my fault. But how on the underground, the one place in the world where he would be with thousands of other people and still be alone. Inspector, I... Oh, what's happened? Who are you? He's the officer detailed to follow Timothy Hearn. Then why didn't he follow Hearn? Why didn't he... Inspector, Why I... didn't you, man? If you'd done your job, this fellow would still be alive. I followed my instructions, sir. He was only out of my sight for five seconds the whole afternoon. When was that? When he got off the underground train. He was walking towards the stairs when he turned suddenly, dodged through some people and bought a newspaper. Newspaper? Yes, sir. The very one that's in his coat pocket. And certainly he wasn't wounded until he got off the train. Else he wouldn't have stopped for a paper. Sergeant, come with me. You think we'll find him, sir? 
What? What's it, do you think? Well, wait here, Sergeant. Cover this exit. Are there any others? No, sir. Did you just spot him, sir? You're sure there are no other exits? Only the emergency ones inside the tube. We'll not let him get that far, will we, Sergeant? And be careful. Our man is insane. I want no innocent people killed. Yes, sir. Uh, Inspector. Yes, Sergeant. You'll take care, won't you? Oh, thank you, Mother. Now I'm going to see a man about a newspaper. Paper, sir. Evening Standard, latest edition. Paper, sir. Uh, how long have you been selling papers here, Mr. Stanley? Oh, you've made a mistake, dear. My name's Charles Bennett. So you remember me, Mr. Stanley? Mr. Edward Stanley? Your face does have a familiar look, but you're very wrong about who I am. It's Bennett that I'm called. Everyone knows that. Bennett, the one with the withered arm. That's how they called me. Man of all work, that's me. And uh, how is Mrs. Stanley, Mr. Stanley? Don't speak her name. Perhaps I can tell you. Your wife was killed, wasn't she, Mr. Stanley? By an airplane that cra- crashed into your house. By three tragic men who were celebrating VE Day. Isn't that how it was, Mr. Stanley? I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Her name's not to be used by scum like you. They were all that to you, weren't they? Rogers, Campbell, and now Hearn, dead. As you wanted them, dead. The circle is complete, isn't it, Mr. Stanley? No. No, not quite. Not quite. Put away that gun. There are innocent people here. Innocent? You're all guilty. Guilty. Sergeant Moffat, head him up. Come on, Inspector. Come and get me. Inspector, there he goes. He's on the truck. Stanley. Stanley, come back here. Ah! that underground tube was a substance, a substance that pressed itself into my brain and down into my lungs. The body of a madman lay crushed and broken under the wheels of a train. And so, in a tragic shriek, was ended the life of a man. A man is hunted. A man is stalked through a city's crowd, through shadows, through a thousand places. And finally, a man is caught. Pursuit. And the pursuit is ended. Pursuit. A criminal strikes and fades quickly back into the shadows of his dark world. And then, the man from Scotland Yard. The relentless, dangerous pursuit. When man hunts man. Now, with Ted DeCorsia starred as the famous Inspector Peter Black of Scotland Yard, we bring you tonight's story of violence and murder. The Pursuit on Lundy Island. Slippery, sir. Mind your step. Thank you, Inspector. All right, Captain. We're ready to go. Cast off all lines. Oh, we may as well go into cabin, sir. Hour and a half run to Lundy. Right you are. Lundy, stand by with a boat hook. Keep me clear of the pilings. Aye, aye, sir. Bit of luck tonight. Dark, but... Fog's lifted for a moment. Yes, quite. Oh, I say, Flower, you. I'm afraid I'll have to catch some fags from you. I seem to have left mine at the end. I'd gone to a favorite inn of mine near Clovelly on the northern coast of Devonshire for a weekend holiday. Even a Scotland Yard man must rest. But unfortunately, the criminal doesn't take that into consideration. The body of a woman had been washed ashore on the island of London. Inspector Reginald Flowerdew of the Barnstable Constabulary, knowing that I was in the vicinity, had phoned for assistance and picked me up. We drove to Biddeford and there boarded a motor launch 
which was soon churning through the dark waters of Bristol Channel, bound for the island of London. At 10 p.m., approximately four hours after the body had been discovered, we sighted the warning light on the high crags overlooking the quiet village. Of course, sir. It's every man to his choice, but I prefer heavier tackle. I still say it depends on the fish. My dear fellow, you might as well use a converted billiard cue for a salmon. <laughs> well, sir, Lord you do have a point there. Can you see something off the shore over there? I'm not sure, Hello. sir. Hello, something up. Ah, I see it. A small vessel. No lights. She's making no headway, sir. Inspector Flower, do. Yes. Would you and the chief inspector come on deck? Right on. Hey, bloody odd. Drifting with no lights. Ahoy, the boat! Ahoy, there! Perhaps we'd better have a look, Captain. Aye. I guess it fool's probably asleep below. Get a line on it, Andy. All fast, sir. Hello, on board. They would have heard us, Captain. Let's have a look. Hey. Dandy, take me a torch. Aye. Yeah, I am. Right. Take the wheel. Keep her stirring in. Right, well, nothing above decks. Shall we try the cabin? Seems to be stuck. Blowed. Empty. No sign of anything. Everything ship shape. Send me a torch, Captain, eh? We hear you. Thank you. Hmm. Albatross. Registered in the name of Daryl Sinfield. Home port Penzance. Come along. I want to have a better look on deck. I wonder if the murdered woman on Lundy could have come from this boat. Possibly, sir. Oh, wait a minute. Yes. Quite possibly. Look here. Blood, hmm? Don't you think? Yes, quite. And by the wheel. The injured person stood at the controls for some time. How far offshore are we, Captain? Oh, I judge about a mile and a half. Hmm, queer. I suggest we take her in tow. If you'll send one of the crew to take the wheel, I think I should like to stay aboard. Aboard the derelict, I noted the following points. The anchor was in place at the bow. The engine cold, but in working order. The fuel tank was half filled. In the mahogany paneling near the wheel was a deep gouge which might have been caused by a bullet. And on closer scrutiny of the cabin, I discovered more traces of blood there. Bloody footprints. We were met at the landing by a now and rather foul old fisherman whom I learned had elected himself island constable. <laughs> About time. Are you the copper from Barnstaple? Police Inspector Flower Dew. This is Chief Detective Inspector Peter Black of Scotland Yard. Ah, I'll be bladdered. You mean you brought Scotland Yard all the way from London for one poor scuttered female? <laughs> My name is William Blee. How do you do, sir? <coughs> yes, quite. Uh, the dead woman, where was she found? Uh, found her myself down to Grouper Cove. I was fishing. In your telephone message, you mentioned foul play. Aye, foulish. Do you know who she is? Aye. <coughs> well? Uh, she's lying in the shed on some nets. Covered her with a tarp. Come. Uh, 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 
Surfish day. The rocks didn't do her face any good. You were saying, Mr. Blee, that you knew who she was. Aye. First I thought it was the Sinfield woman. Ah, uh, Sinfield? Uh, but it ain't. Tis her companion, Maggie Pratt. Sinfield. That would be Mr. Darrell Sinfield? Aye. He owns the Albatross? Aye. Do you know where he is? Aye. Mr. Blee, I'm delighted to have you assist us. But I'd be most grateful if you would be a little more literal and a little less monosyllabic. <laughs> That's a blabberish mouthful. <laughs> All right, he's fishing. He went off in his other boat, the turn. Hello. Inspector. What is it? Looks like bullet wound in the head. Point of entrance here, exit here. Yes. Mr. Blee, yeah. is Mrs. Sinfield on the island? Aye, she is. She's out at the cottage with that keel flagged Irishman of hers, Kyle. Has she been notified of the death? Aye. She got vaporish, and the Irishman's taking care of her. I'll want you to take me out there. Aye, aye. Tis a short walk, though mayhap not for a cityish man. I'm sure I can manage with your help. <laughs> uh, Flower, you will want to get the body back to the mainland. I'd like an autopsy as soon as possible and laboratory tests of the blood stains. Right you are, sir. I'll take it myself if you want to carry on here. Good show. Oh, by the way, would you send a message through to the yard for me? Yes, of course, sir. I'd like Detective Sergeant Moffat assigned to the case. Request that he catch the first plane, will you? Right you are, sir. And uh, now, Mr. Blee, uh, I am at your service. Whilst he slotted His Majesty's language, William Blee managed to convey some rather interesting facts. Namely, that Mr. and Mrs. Sinfield had separated some two months before, and that she had not been on the island since that time but had arrived by plane during the afternoon with the keel flagged Irishman, Cahill. The Sinfield Cottage turned out to be something more than a cottage. It rested on a knoll and commanded a view of the sea and a promontory that stretched out before it. <coughs> ah, there she be, Mr. Black, and I'll go no further. Oh? I'll have naught to do with that skirtish woman and that blister-bladdering Kyle. Yes, quite. Uh, but uh, I'll wait for you. Uh, while you're in there, I'll do some clamming for tomorrow's fishing. <laughs> Good evening. Mr. Cahill? Yes? Inspector Black, Scotland Yard. Oh, 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 yes, yes, about Miss Pratt. Yes, of course. Won't you come in? Thank you very much. Come into the library, do. There, there's a fire there. Pamela, that is, Mrs. Sinfield, is terribly upset. Maggie had been with her four or five years. Yes, I understand. Who is at the door, Hugh? You... Oh. This is Inspector Black, my dear. Mrs. Sinfield, Inspector. How do you do? Madam. Is there any news of Jack? Jack, Mrs. Sinfield? Oh, yes, didn't you know? Jack Kettle. He's on the albatross with Maggie. I think you'd better tell me from the beginning. Well, no, perhaps you'd no, rather... No, you. The... I'm all right. Oh. Mr. Cahill and I came over to the island this afternoon to talk to my husband. We had planned to cross in the albatross, but Jack found motor trouble, and so we flew. If we hadn't... Now, 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 please, Pamela, don't think about what might have been... Jack Kettle is a sailor of sorts, Inspector. He's been taking care of the albatross. Mrs. Sinfield told him to bring the boat over after repairs, and Maggie was to come with him. Maggie's always been with me. I can't stand it. We want to harm her. We found the boat, Mrs. Sinfield. The, the albatross? Yes. And Jack? The boat was adrift approximately a mile and a half offshore. It was empty. Empty? <laughs> I'm truly sorry that I have to question you at this time, but it's terribly important to establish these details. Now, at what hour might you have expected them to arrive here? Well, no, it's, it's difficult to say, Inspector. It depends upon the extent of the repairs. But they still should have got here before nightfall. 
We watched for them until it was too foggy to see anymore. I gather, Mrs. Sinfield, that your husband has not yet returned. Uh, no, I don't know where he can be. Have you any means of communication with the village? No, I'm afraid not. Uh, Mr. Cahill, I'd appreciate a notification as soon as Mr. Sinfield does return. Oh, yes, yes, of course, I'd be happy to. Uh, you're staying in the village? Yes, at the inn, I believe. Well, I think that's all. Good night, Mrs. Sinfield. Thank you, Inspector. I'll see you to the door, sir. Oh, thank you. Inspector, did, did you... Did you find absolutely nothing aboard the Albatross? I'm afraid not. <sighs> Incredible. Well, what could have happened? That is what I intend to find out. Good night, sir. Good night. Well, Mr. B, finished your clamming? Nay, I never clam. I thought to serve a better purpose by peeping through the window at that rancid pair. <laughs> you learned little, I'll be bound. Not quite. I noted there must have been a marked resemblance between the dead woman and Mrs. Sinfield. Aye. <laughs> I thought you would. The next morning, Moffat arrived by a special plane. And over a late breakfast of porridge and smoked roll, I brought him up to the mark on the case. Well, sir, rather messed up your holiday, I'd say. Well, I've known Inspector Flower Dew for quite some time. I couldn't very well let him down. More roll, Moffat. No, thank you, sir. I'm quite finished. Right, oh. <clears throat> I haven't heard from the Sinfield place. I think we'd better hop out there. Worried about the husband, sir? I'm not sure. This is a pretty place, sir. Yes, it is. I imagine fishing is quite good. I'd like to try my hand here. Some... Huh? Oh, Mr. Black! Oh, dear. William Blee, Moffat. The local something or other. Uh, what is it, Mr. Blee? Ah, scuttering wind. No good for fishing. <laughs> Yorkish. <coughs> well, we've got another one. Another one, Mr. Blee? Aye, I was coming to fetch you. He just whisked ashore the body of a man. Pursuit. With Ted DeCorsia starred as Inspector Peter Black, the pursuit on Lundy Island continues in just a moment. Gracie Allen has one of the sweetest dispositions in the world. But her sweetness and light get the acid test when a hit-and-run driver smashes up a fender on her beautiful jalopy tomorrow night. Acid test. There's plenty of acid when Gracie finds that husband George is probably the responsible party. So be listening when the Burns and Allen Show comes your way on most of these same CBS stations this Wednesday night. Yes, sir. Uh, Do you think it's the chap from the Albatross, Jack Kettle? I'm afraid so, but come along. I'll make sure. The poor, sudden friend that had once been a man was identified Jack Kettle by papers in his pocket. He'd been shot twice. Once through the left shoulder and then in the back. But here, the bullet had not passed through his body. Now we had something concrete with which to proceed. 
By the time I had arranged for removal of the body to the mainland so that the bullet could be recovered, another development had occurred. Darrell Sinfield had returned from his fishing trip and was waiting for me in the study of his house on the north. Yes, sit down, Inspector. Yes, sit down. I hope you don't mind my receiving you in here, but since my... My dear wife is in the house. This is the one room where I may find privacy. My hunting and fishing room. I envy you, sir. You have a magnificent collection of rods and guns. Uh, thank you. I take a great deal of pride in them. Yes, you must. Uh, Mr. Sinfield, I presume you've learned of the tragic events of the past few hours. Yes, my wife told me. Any word of the young sailor? I'm afraid so. He, too, had been shot. His body was recovered a short time ago. Uh, Lundy has been such a peaceful place. Mr. Sinfield, mm. we discovered the boat Albatross unmanned and adrift about a mile and a half offshore last night. Did you at any time during your fishing trip sight her? No, I'm sorry. I was fishing over Five Mile Bank. That's off the southern tip of the island. Oh, tell me, sir. Any luck? <laughs> I'm afraid not. It was rotten. I uh, managed to muck up my boat with a few bloody mackerel, that's all. No, oh, shame. Well, I shall probably be calling on you again, sir. I hope you won't mind. No, no, no. Of course not. Uh, Inspector, I hope you'll understand if I don't show you to the door. As long as my wife is in this house with that man, uh, Carhill, I allow myself the indulgence of self-pity and prefer not to face either one of them. Yes, quite. Oh, um, one more point, sir. Do you keep the cabinet to your gun collection locked? No, I've never had any reason. I find Lundy folk are quite honest. Oh, that's a refreshing fact, sir. Good morning. Goodbye, sir. Oh, Inspector. Oh, there you are, Mrs. Sinfield. I was about to look for you. You and I just heard about poor Jack. Won't you come into the library, please? Oh, of course. Oh, good morning, Inspector. This is shocking news. Have you progressed at all? Oh, this is a very odd affair. As a matter of fact, you can help me. I'm trying to establish a time element. Since you didn't know when the albatross left the mainland after her repairs, could you give me the name of the dockmaster? Uh, uh, no, Hugh, it's no use. Inspector, the albatross wasn't in need of repair. We lied to you. Oh? Didn't seem important at the time. I still have my pride, and I... I didn't want anyone to know that I'd come to beg my husband to give me my freedom. When I told him yesterday that you and I were coming over on the albatross to settle things once and for all... He said he'd be gone by the time we got here. He didn't want to see us. That's why we took the plane. We thought we could catch him unaware. Maggie and Jack Kettle were to pick us up in the Albatross later. Mrs. Sinfield, is your husband in the habit of carrying a rifle aboard his boat? Why do you ask? When I talked to him, I noticed that one was missing from his gun cabin. I really couldn't be sure. I know he practices a great deal. He's a wonderful marksman. Good heavens, you don't suspect. My dear Mrs. Sinfield, at this moment I have no alternative but to suspect everyone. <laughs> Moffat and I wanted to look at Sinfield's fishing boat, the turn. We found her moored at his private landing at the inlet. We went aboard and made our discovery in the cabin. Oh, well, Moffat, here it is. Ah, a 303, sir. Yes. One shell in the chamber and an empty clip. Capacity five. That means he fired four, sir. And recently, from the smell of it. Mm, it doesn't make sense, Moffat. An innocent man might leave a rifle like this, but would a murderer? He might, sir. He did have a motive. A jealous husband planning to do away with his wife and her lover. We know he expected them on the albatross. He could have waited on his boat. Good show, Muffet. An expert marksman, say, 150 yards, close enough for accuracy, but distant enough to bring about a mistake in identity. You did mention a resemblance between the maid and Mrs. Cynthia. All right, you are. He shoots her first, she topples overboard, he never sees her again. Uh -huh. Then Kettle, first through the shoulder, then in the back. Uh -huh. He reaches the wheel and tries to swing out of range. In splendid reconstruction, if I do say so myself. There's only one thing wrong with it. Oh, what's that, sir? 
Mr. Carhill and Mrs. Sinfield, we have only their word that they didn't see the albatross come into this inlet. Mm. Perhaps they did see it. They could have waited high on that cliff, armed with one of the husband's rifles. But why, sir, if they... My dear chap, so that we would do exactly what we have done. Build a most excellent case against Mr. Sinfield. The arrest of an unwanted husband would be a novel way of getting rid of him. Even to the extent of spending the lives of two innocent people? If such was their plan, yes. Uh. I left Moffat to further search Mr. Sinfield's fishing boat. A heavy afternoon mist had started to drift across the island, and I walked out on the high promontory that stretched like an accusing finger from the house on the north. There, at the edge of the cliff, I searched for traces of a hidden rifleman. Uh, uh, oh. Uh, tis a clamish day, Mr. Black. Mr. Blee. Uh, but no clams to be found. The tide is too high. I wasn't looking for clams, Mr. Blee. Oh, then you're looking for ways and means. Yes, Mr. Blee. I owe you an apology. I underestimated you. <laughs> <laughs> are you looking for clams, or are you looking for shells? That is a riddlish question, friend Black. It calls for a riddlish answer. The one is the boat, and the boat is the one. <laughs> yeah, but the weather is driveling again. Tell me, is it usually like this at this hour? Aye, you can set your watch by it this time of year. In other words, the fog comes over the island and moves out across the channel toward the mainland. Aye. Uh, could it be foggy here in the inlet, but a mile or so offshore remain clear as it was last night when I arrived? Aye. That's what it does every day. And tis a sad truth, for it'll bring deadness to a man. Yes, Mr. Blee. I think it will. <laughs> The strange old fisherman accompanied me back to the cottage on the knoll and left me at the front door. Inspector Flowerdew had returned from the mainland with complete autopsy, ballistics, and laboratory reports. Moffat had gathered the suspects together in the library. You have forced me into a very uh, unpleasant situation, Inspector. To be in the presence of this man... This woman, whom I no longer consider my wife. You think it's any more pleasant for us? Please, please, darling. I'm sorry for you all. But murder is an unpleasant business and needs to be disposed of as quickly as possible. If you're prepared to do that, why are Pamela and I forced to witness it? For very good reason, Mr. Cahill. We have proof of innocence, which in this case establishes proof of guilt. You are being devious. Come to the point. Very well, Mr. Sinfield, I shall. Your wife and Mr. Carhill came here and awaited the arrival of the albatross. Mr. Carhill, do you consider yourself accurate with a rifle? Uh, of course he is. He's a fine shot. Mr. Carhill, could you hit a man at 300 yards? Now, no, look here. I don't know what you're trying to do, but I... You I, see, I... Mr. Sinfield, they did have opportunity, but they also had fog. Fog that made it impossible to see even 30 feet. Are you suggesting that their supposed innocence makes me guilty? Exactly, sir. We found a rifle on your boat. It had been fired. Of course it had. I shot a basking shark while I was fishing. I often do. A great ugly brute shy the fish away. That would be most difficult to prove. I suppose you will also deny that you were aboard the albatross after you shot both of its passengers. I shall? Quite so. How do you account for the blood stains we found on your fishing boat? Quite easily. Have you never caught mackerel, sir? They bleed like pigs. Exactly. And we found traces of that mackerel blood aboard the albatross. Uh, Tommy Rod, it proves nothing. Very well. According to the autopsy report, your shots were not alone responsible for Kettle's death. He jumped from the albatross and drowned. Why would he do that? How should I know? He jumped from the boat because you were pursuing him. When you failed to find him on deck, you went into the cabin, leaving further traces on the floor. I repeat, you have no proof. It's all guesswork. You're trying to bluff. This bullet, sir, is scarcely bluff. It was recovered from the man's body and has been traced to your rifle. Well, Mr. Sinfield, I think that's all. Yes. Yes, 
That's all. This time I'll do the job properly. <laughs> Daryl Sinfield's clutching fingers never reached his wife's throat. But they spoke his guilt much more eloquently than all of the evidence amassed against him. Pursuit. And the pursuit is ended. Pursuit is produced by Elliot Lewis. The script is written by Anthony Ellis and Gil Dowd, who directed tonight's show. Music was composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Featured in the cast were Raymond Lawrence, Joseph Kearns, Dan O'Herlihy, Bill Johnstone, John Daner, Peggy Weber, and Ramsey Hill. Pursuit. Next week, Pursuit will bring you another dramatic story of the man from Scotland Yard, relentlessly hunting down those whose disordered passions breed violence and murder. With Ted DeCorsia starring as Inspector Peter Black, next week we will present another story of man hunting man when we bring you Pursuit. and fades quickly back into the shadows of his dark world. And then, the man from Scotland Yard, the relentless, dangerous pursuit, when man hunts man. Now, with Ted DeCorsia starred as the famous inspector Peter Black of Scotland Yard, we bring you tonight's story of violence and murder, three for all. <laughs> Sometime, somewhere, somehow, every man touches another and leaves a scar. A word is said, a deed is done, and a mortal hate is planted. And sometimes that hate can become death, violent death, murder. Then a man must be hunted. A man must be stalked. Through a city's crowd, through the sunlit noon, through the twilight shadows, through a thousand places. And finally, a man must be caught. Pursuit. At Scotland Yard, that's our job. Inspector Black? Yes, Sergeant. Chief Inspector Harkness wants to see you. He said, please hurry. Oh, thank you, Moffat. Right away. Oh, good morning, Black. Come in, come in. Sit down. Uh, thank you. Sergeant Moffat made it sound very urgent, sir. Did he? May or may not be. I want your opinion on it. On what, sir? In this note. Came this morning's mail. It's made up of letters clipped from a newspaper. The thing was addressed to me, and it says, A man, Melville Rogers, will be found dead today with a knife in him. He will be dead. May I see it, sir? Well, of course. Have we found a man with a knife in him today, Black? Not yet, sir. We've had many notes of this type before, and nothing has come of them. Uh, however, Black, will you look into it? Of course, sir. Excuse me, Black. Darkness here. What? Yes? Now give me that address again. Gruber's Tea Shop, 12 Buxton Lane. I have it, thank you. Well, Black? Yes, sir? They have found a man with a knife in him. A man named Melville Rogers. You'll look into it, won't you? Moving about your business. Stand back, please. This way, Inspector. In here, sir. Uh, thank you, Mark. That one's Mrs. Gruber, the proprietor of the restaurant. I see. I shall want to talk to her in a few minutes. The deceased, sir. 
He was stabbed to death as you see him sitting at this table, looking out of the window. You've established his identification? Yes, sir. Name's Melville Rogers, lived in Kensington. Known to Mrs. Gruber over there. Had his meals here every day. I see. And uh, who are these other people? Those three? Customers, sir. Dining at the time Mr. Rogers was discovered dead. Mm. Uh, tell me, Moffat, who noticed that he was dead? Mrs. Gruber, one of the customers? This one. Oh, I did, sir. Oh, I did all right. And who are you? Uh, Charles Bennett, sir. Two N's and one T. I live in Quimby Street nearby. Uh, did you get the name, sir? Charles Bennett. Yes, yes, Charles Bennett. Uh, tell me, Mr. Bennett, how did you happen to discover this man was dead? Well, I'm not a physician, sir, but that knife sticking in his side... And he wasn't breathing, sir. Yes. No, I'm not a physician, but there are ways to tell when a man's dead. Naturally. You noticed this as soon as you came into the restaurant? Oh, no, sir. When I came in, the place was crowded. Not a table. So I waited. Even when there was a place to sit, I waited. You might wonder why I did that, sir. Yes, I might. Well, you've noticed I have a withered arm. Yes, I had. I don't hide it very well, do I? Oh, it's not that I'm ashamed. It's not that at all, but... You were waiting for this particular table. Why? Because, uh, well, it's obvious. It's the only table near the window. So I might sit and none of the other customers would notice me. My arms, sir. What do you do for a living, Mr. Bennett? Not much I can do. Odd jobs. Better newspapers. What one you might say for a wage. But sometimes I do a painting job on a house. But you see, sir, it's my arm. It's withered. There's not much a man can do with an answer. And so it went. The routine questions and answers. The peering in upon a handful of lives which had been thrown hard against violence. The important and impersonal data which would head a new file at Scotland Yard labeled Melville Rogers, Death by Murder. Melville Rogers, a recluse, a bachelor, a man who drove a bus from Battersea to Kingston. Not an enemy in the world, his friends said, which of course is ridiculous. Telephone for you, sir. Oh, thank you, Sergeant. Who is it? The caller won't say. A matter of urgency, though, it seems. Right. Inspector Black here. Really now? Who is this? Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Who is this? <laughs> For me. Who are you? It's difficult to hear. I know. I've arranged it that way. <laughs> oh. Did you find the dead man, Inspector? Did you find Melville Rogers? I killed him. Sergeant Moffat, trace this call. But it was. A... Did you ask how much to trace this call, Inspector? I'll save you the trouble. I'll tell you where I am. Where are you? On Lyle Street, in a pub, the Green Dot. Yeah, but, but I won't wait. Listen, Inspector. There's a man here. His name is James Campbell. He, he's looking at me now, and he's smiling. I'm going to stop talking with you, and then I'm going to take a walk with James Campbell, and then I'm going to stick a knife in him. <laughs> Hello? 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 Lyle Street lies across the face of London like an open wound. It is a street that's well known to Scotland Yard. The brownstone buildings that line it present a facade of drab respectability, but within them is all that is depraved and vicious and corrupt. On Lyle Street, the essence of a man is measured in terms of his brutality. Here are the delicate refinements of crime. The long fingernails with razor blades beneath them for the slitting of pockets or of throats. The smirk of death painted on the lips of women. The Green Dot was no different from other basement pubs on Lyle Street. It had a massive door with a peephole through which a face peered out at you. And then you were permitted to enter because you were known. And because you were known, you were greeted with a bitter silence. Any 
anything we can do for you, Inspector? I'm looking for a man named James Campbell. Do you know him? Now, there's a proper question, Inspector. And I'll give you a proper answer. No, I don't know James Campbell. Is any one of you James Campbell? It would be well to tell me if you are, because a man named James Campbell is going to be murdered. Oh, now there's an interesting bit of news, Inspector, and I'm sure all of us here appreciate it. Someone here telephoned me at Scotland Yard. Who was it, Arnold? Yeah, now you know better than to ask me that, Inspector. All sorts of people home to all sorts of places. There's no accounting for tastes, you know. How long is it since you've been in prison, Arnold? A year, two. I don't rightly care to remember unpleasant things of that sort. It could be unpleasant again, Arnold, easily, quite easily. Beg your pardon, Inspector. Yes? There's a phone call for you. For me? Yes, in the, in the booth over there. Oh, thank you. And like I say, Inspector, all sorts of people come to all sorts of places. Black here. Hello, Black Hardness. Uh, yes, sir. I understand you're down there looking for a man named James Campbell. That's right, sir. Well, I had a telephone call just now. A person with a peculiar kind of voice. He said that James Campbell can be found at 12 Clover Crossing West. That's in Soho. Get over there at once. Right, sir. There it is, sir. Here's his room. Mr. Campbell. James Campbell. Door's locked, sir. Yes. Sergeant. Yes, sir. No one here in the sitting room? No, no. Well, there's some more room, sir. Uh, look in that one. And, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Look in the closets. In any place that might be big enough to hold a man's body. Yes, sir. I'll search the bedroom. Steam boiled through the bathroom door, obscuring everything. The whole place was a miasma of white enamel, hazy, drenched with birds of sweat. And in the shower stall, a man, face downward, fully clothed. Blood seeped from a wound in his neck, and mixing with the water washed away. And then I saw it. A wilted piece of paper tacked to the door. A paper on which was glued words cut from a newspaper. Mr. Campbell is dead, Inspector, it said. There have been two. Tomorrow night at eight, there will be a third, it said. The second act of Pursuit will follow in just a moment. But first... The shortest marathon in the world. That's the Arthur Godfrey daytime show on CBS. Every weekday, Monday through Friday, your man Godfrey entertains for 75 whole minutes, an hour and a quarter, and the time speeds by in nothing flat. Give a listen to Arthur Godfrey's daytime show every weekday on most of these same CBS stations. And now, back to the second act of Pursuit. <laughs> Murder is an ultimate, and pursuit is a variation on the theme. But it so happened that this pursuit was in my domain, because all of London is Scotland Yard's domain. And in the morning, when the papers brought the news to London, it was a city which slackened its pace to allow the horror to settle. Horror and fascination. It resolved itself into simple terms. A manhunt. Man the hunted... Man the hunter. And it was the hunted who absorbed the city's imagination. The hunted who had taken special pains to make it known that some obscure lust for violence possessed him and he would kill again this evening at eight. Scotland Yard's part in it was not nearly so spectacular. All we had to do was find a man or a woman. Well, Black, you can't say this murderer hasn't given us fair warning. If you call 24 hours notice fair... Then more than 12 hours of that already run out. I tell you, all of London's aroused about this thing. I know it, sir, but frankly, I don't know how we can stop him. 
And if we don't, someone who's walking about alive in the noonday sun will be dead by 8 o'clock. Well, you'd better get busy then, man. Oh, good day, Sergeant. Good day, sir. You haven't much time. Get busy, he says. Haven't much time, he says. <laughs> well, what do you have, Moffat? You better have a look for yourself, sir. Yeah. The life histories of the two murdered men. That is, from what information we've been able to obtain. I see. Yes. The first man who was murdered, Melville Rogers, born in Chichester. The second, James Campbell, born in Guernsey. Mm -hmm. You see, Inspector, their paths never crossed until 1939. And it's the part that's important. Both joined the RAF as ground crewmen in 39. On the same day, trained in the same camp. I haven't had time to get their war record yet, if that's necessary. However, there's this. They were both discharged from the Sheffield barracks near Huntington. Yes, according to this, on the same day. Good work, Sergeant. Thank you, sir. You say Sheffield barracks near Huntington. On the main road, sir, as you approach it from the south. Call them. Tell them I'm on my way. Good afternoon, sir. I was told to expect you. Oh, good afternoon, Private. I want to see the service records of two men. Melville Rogers... Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. Service records, two men. Oh, I'm afraid that's impossible. Did they tell you I'm from Scotland Yard? Hey, but I'm not allowed in those files, sir. Well, who is? Is that proper private? Uh, Corporal, this gentleman's from Scotland Yard. Oh, interesting, Walt. I'm in a great hurry, Corporal. I need some information. A man's life may depend on it. A man's life, you say? What man? Who is the officer in charge here? I'm in charge temporarily, sir. What do you want? The service records of two men, Melville Rogers and James Campbell. Oh, are they serving in this barracks? Not now. They Then we wouldn't have such records, sir. I'm sorry. They received their discharge after the war from this barracks. I see. You see what? Look, you now, you'll have to see the personnel officer through that door, sir. It's Flight Lieutenant Modier you want to see. Thank you. Yes? Lieutenant Modier. Yes? I'm Inspector Peter Black, Scotland Yard. Yes? I must see the service records of two men who were discharged from this barracks. Yes? Melville Rogers and James Campbell. It's urgent. Oh, no, really? It's a matter of life and death. A man's life may depend upon your getting up from that chair, walking over to wherever you have such records on file, pulling them out and handing them to I them. say. Do it. Do it fast. Well, it's quite impossible, you know. I don't know anything of the kind. Well, I was saying such matters must be cleared. S2 must clear it. Intelligence, you know. Files are confidential. Who is the intelligence officer? Major Browning, right down the corridor. The last office on the left, all the way down. Thank you. <laughs> I say, that, that, that's a good one. <laughs> Just a minute. Uh, there's a chap standing there who wants to see me, I suppose. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. The yes. same to you, Bertie. <laughs> Yes, what can I do for you, old man? I'm Peter Black, Inspector, Scotland Yard. Uh, have a chair. I, I could ring for tea a little early. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or is it? What do you say? Uh, no tea, thank you. This is very urgent, Major. Oh, urgent, you say? Good, good. Very good indeed. Uh, What's urgent? A man's life is desperately close to drawing to an end, Major. Violently. A man will be murdered if you don't help him. What man, indeed? Huh? Major, hmm? there isn't that much time. I must have the files on two ex-members of the RAF ground crew. Two men who got their discharge here. James Campbell and Melville Rogers. Mm, uh, familiar names, both of them familiar. Mm. How familiar? Oh, for, for familiar. Huh? How? Hmm? Say something. How are these names familiar? Oh, should be. I court-martialed them myself. Huh? Campbell and Rogers and... Uh, yes, and... What the devil was that uh, other fellow's name? Uh, I can't think of it, can't Well, think of it. You must think of it. Name, name, name. T -t 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 Timothy. Uh, Timothy Hearn. N N M I. No middle initial. Timothy Hearn. That's what I want. I won't need the files if you can tell me why you remember them. Oh, uh, easy. On, on V E Day, these three rascals stole a plane. Mm. Smith. Smith. Absolutely. Celebrating. Loaded to the aileron. Stole a Lancaster. Flew around. Didn't fly badly for for ground crew men. Ran out of gas. Bailed out. Plane crashed into a house. Killed a woman. Mrs. Edward Stanley. So that's it. Motive, revenge. You say a Mrs. Stanley was killed? Uh, how about her husband? Can't tell you a thing about her husband. Edward, uh, Edward his name was, Edward Stanley. I tried to find him, make an adjustment, tried everything to find him. 
fellow seems to have vanished from the face of the earth. Uncanny, wasn't Not it? Not really uncanny, Major. Uh, do you mind if I use your telephone? I can tell you this, though. If you want Timothy Hearn, look in Cotton Garden. He, a busker there. Can't miss him. Oh, colorful chap. Uh, wears a red polka dot muffler. A colorful chap, yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, do you mind if I use your telephone? Yours, old boy. Uh, operator, this is Inspector Black. Put me through to Scotland Yard. I want to talk with Sergeant Moffat. Hurry. I say, oh, boy, why are you waiting? Would you like to hear the other one? Bertie, just tell me it's funny, you know. Uh, Hello, Moffat. <laughs> Inspector Black speaking. Two things I want you to do. Trace a man named Edward Stanley, whose wife was killed in an airplane accident on V.E. Day. Do you have that? Good. And I want you to keep your eye on a busker named Timothy Hearn. Covent Garden. I'll meet you there. <laughs> Sergeant Moffat. Hello, sir. Did you find anything on Edward Stanley? Not a thing, sir. There's no trace of it. The busker, Timothy Hearn. He's right over there, sir, entertaining the crowd. A clown dances and sings on a sunlit street. And the grotesque shadows that men again are death. I watched Timothy Hearn, the busker, perform for the queue waiting outside the theater. He was a little man with a clown's radiant face. He wore a silk polka dot muffler and tied Natalie around his throat. His clothes were frayed, but somehow he managed a kind of regal relevance. Then he passed through the crowd rattling a tambourine. Some dropped coins into it, some didn't. Then he was standing in front of me. Did you like my pantomime, sir? Always aim to please, I do. And you know, I perform for the best I am. It was fine. It hit, Timothy. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. I say, may I ask how you knew my name? It's not often we buskers are given any kind of billing from our beloved public. <laughs> Is there somewhere we could talk? Oh, I'll go on again in a few minutes, sir. Uh, acrobatic dance. Uh, perhaps we could have a nice talk some other time. Good day, sir. I'm Inspector Black, Scotland Yard, Timothy. Oh. <laughs> uh, fellow professional, you might say. We may sort of put a different light on it. We can talk over here by the vegetable stall, Inspector. Very well. Well, sir, it's true I don't have a performer's permit, but I think a chef's got to do something, you know. Uh, what's the fine, Inspector? You once knew two men named Melville Rogers and John Campbell. It, uh, it was a long time ago, Inspector. I've already done penning for that. Rogers and Campbell were murdered. Did you know that? Yes, I did. How did it affect you that day? After our court martial, we never spoke to each other again. I guess it was the ugly shame of it. Of all of it. Their death, how did it affect you, Timothy? I try not to think about it, sir. Timothy, this is a hard thing to tell a man, but I must. The murderer has established a pattern. I believe you are part of that pattern. Do you mean he wants to kill me, too? But why? I've never harmed anyone. Except... Except... Exactly. Except the woman who was killed in that unfortunate airplane incident. And someone who loved her very much is the man we're looking for. Before he murdered, he sent us a note. Each time there was a note announcing his victim's death. He announced yours would take place at eight tonight. What? And that doesn't give us much time, me or you. What shall I do, Inspector? Actually, there's nothing for you to do. You're to act as you always act. One of our men will be with you all the time. You won't see him, and you're not to look for him. But I want you in your own home before eight tonight. Before eight? Right, Inspector. I say, you catch him before... before we'll I... do our best, Timothy. I promise you, we'll do our best. There was no turning back now. I had made a choice and accepted a responsibility. And if I were wrong, I was offering up a frightened busker named Timothy Ahern as a sacrifice to a madman. It was a setting for murder. The background was precise. A dismal corner where Marleybone Road crosses Oxford Street 
damp beneath an early evening drizzle where the wetness had spread the reflection from the street lamps into a yellow film. A corner where Timothy Hearn lived. A corner of shadows and silence. At seven, a police cordon was lined around the block. A few minutes before eight, I was standing in the doorway next door to Timothy's, waiting. Inspector. Yes, yes, Sergeant. Everything's ready. Good. All the intersections covered? Yes, sir. No one can possibly get through. Except the busker. Except Timothy Hearn and whoever might be following him, if it's a stranger. Exactly, sir. All right. Off the street now, Sergeant. In this doorway with me. Yes, sir. Sergeant. Sir? The underground entrance. Look at it. Oh, I think so, sir. The busker. Yes. On time. Right on time. What? He seems to be drunk, sir. He's not drunk. Let's go. Timothy! Timothy Hearn! Tip. Oh, Inspector. Dead. Timothy Hearn, busker, dead. And it was my fault. But how on the you? underground, the one place in the world where he would be with thousands of other people and still be alone. Inspector, I... Oh. What's happened? Who are you? He's the officer detailed to follow Timothy Hearn. Then why didn't he follow Hearn? Why didn't he... Inspector, Why I... didn't you, man? If you'd done your job, this fellow would still be alive. I followed my instructions, sir. He was only out of my sight for five seconds the whole afternoon. When was that? When he got off the underground train. He was walking towards the stairs when he turned suddenly, dodged through some people and bought a newspaper. Newspaper? Yes, sir. The very one that's in his coat pocket. And certainly he wasn't wounded until he got off the train. Else he wouldn't have stopped for a paper. Sergeant, come with me. You think we'll find him, sir? What? What's it, do you think? Uh, wait here, Sergeant. Cover this exit. Are there any others? No, sir. Did you just spot him, sir? You're sure there are no other exits? Only the emergency ones inside the tube. We'll not let him get that far, will we, Sergeant? And be careful. Our man is insane. I want no innocent people killed. Yes, sir. Uh, Inspector. Yes, Sergeant. You'll take care, won't you? Oh, thank you, Mother. Now I'm going to see a man about a newspaper. Evening paper, sir. Evening standard latest edition. Paper, sir. Uh, how long have you been selling papers here, Mr. Stanley? Oh, you've made a mistake, dear. My name's Charles Bennett. So you remember me, Mr. Stanley? Mr. Edward Stanley? Your face does have a familiar look, but you're very wrong about who I am. It's Bennett that I'm called. Everyone knows that. Bennett, the one with the withered arm. That's how they called me. Man of all work, that's me. And uh, how is Mrs. Stanley, Mr. Stanley? Don't speak her name. Perhaps I can tell you. Your wife was killed, wasn't she, Mr. Stanley? By an airplane that cra crashed into your house. By three tragic men who were celebrating V.E. Day. Isn't that how it was, Mr. Stanley? I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Her name's not to be used by scum like you. They were all that to you, weren't they? Rogers, Campbell, and now Hearn, dead. As you wanted them, dead. The circle is complete, isn't it, Mr. Stanley? No. No, not quite. Not quite. Put away that gun. There are innocent people here. Innocent? You're all guilty. Guilty. Sergeant Moffat, head him off. Come on, Inspector. Come and get me. Inspector, there he goes. He's on the truck. Stanley. Stanley, come back here. Ah! that underground tube was a substance, a substance that pressed itself into my brain and down into my lungs. The body of a madman lay crushed and broken under the wheels of a train. And so, in a tragic shriek, was ended the life of a man. A man is hunted. A man is stalked through a city's crowd, through shadows, through a thousand places. And finally, a man is caught. Pursuit. And the pursuit is ended. And now, Pursuit. Pursuit. 
pursuit. A criminal strikes and fades quickly back into the shadows of his own dark world. And then the man from Scotland Yard, the famous inspector Peter Black, and the dangerous, relentless pursuit. When man hunts man. Now, with Ben Wright starred as the famous inspector Peter Black of Scotland Yard, we bring you tonight's story, Pursuit of the Thames Pirates. Chap's got a date. A ruddy business like this comes up. Not fair. I'm going to resign. Yes, sir? No, Moffitt. Yes, sir? Uh, we're going on the river tonight. Thames Division. Oh, sir? But Mr. I Moffitt... can't help it. Inspector Trevallion just called. I had a date, too. I'll meet you outside. Yes, sir. Hello? Uh, hello. This is uh, uh, Peter. Oh, Peter, darling. I'll be ready in a half an hour. Um, Anne... I, 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 yes, I love you madly, but if I keep talking, I'll never get my face on. And I, I'm afraid something's happened that... What? I have to work. No. Oh, no. Yes, I'm afraid so. You mean we're not going out? I'm terribly sorry. Oh, Peter. Uh, look, here, I must run, but may I call you later? Well, I don't know. I might be home and I might not. I'm very angry with you, Peter. This is the first oh, Well, time. I'm so sorry, really. I'm... Well, you might have called earlier. I, uh... Ready, sir? Oh, uh, Muffet, uh, yes. Well? Uh, uh, may I call you later? Oh, I suppose so. Uh, yes. Well, um, thanks very much. Goodbye. Uh, all right. Come on, Muffet. Keep your eye on the port quarter. Over there, near the dock? Yes. See? Yeah. It doesn't seem to be moving. Well, she is, though. No lights. Makes it hard to tell. Probably cut their motor. Peters! Aye, sir. Port quarter. When I give the word, switch on the search. I want to have a look at that boat. Aye, aye, sir. It's funny we didn't see them slip past, Trevelyan. Might have moved around the barge anchored over there. Not much visibility tonight, anyway. Well, I think we ought to move in closer. Oh, not yet, old boy. If they're the ones, they'd slip out. Whatever they've got is too fast for us. All right, Peter, switch on. Start your engine, Macintosh. What engine, sir? <laughs> Are you served on one of those, didn't you, Trevelyan? Well, something like it. It could be a Thornycroft MTB. A little small, though. Ahoy! Motorboat! I'm coming aboard. Heave to. Half speed ahead, McIntosh. Half speed, sir. Hello, she's ringing about. I'm going to stop. How to stop it, Macintosh? She's trying to ram. Look out. Get down. The entire Metropolitan Police Force had been on the alert for a gang of waterfront thieves. They'd been in operation for over a year, but during the past three weeks had enlarged operations to such an extent that every available man had been sent to the docks vicinity. Ten division launches had intensified their patrols, and still we had not been able to put a stop to the piracy. We knew that they were using a high-powered motorboat, and further, they chose foggy or moonless nights for their attack. However, that night, we found them, with a vengeance. I was flat on my face, trying to bury myself in the deck of a bouncing police launch while a machine gun bullet whipped over me. You all right, Black? Oh, happy as a lark. I couldn't think of a nicer way to spend an evening. What about you, Moffitt? Wish I had a pump on, sir. Yes, I know what you mean. Peter, get on the wireless. It's a whopping. Tell them we've made contact with a craft. Uh, MTP. That'll be close enough. Heading up river. Ask them to intercept. Close the Teddington lock. Aye, aye, sir. Macintosh, third engine, full throttle. Aye, sir. I hate to ask this, but aren't we begging for trouble? I mean, this speed in fog. Oh, well, they're doing it. We've got to catch them. All right, I'll take the wheel, Macintosh. Very good, sir. Can't see a blessed thing. Where are we? Oh, half a tick. Greenwich Reach. Isle of Dogs over there. Oh, yes. Oh, that chap got nerve. Must know where he's going. I hope you do. Oh, nothing to it, old boy. Just so long as we don't hit a barge or a log or something like that. How fast are we going? 30. Feels like 60. If we hit anything, it won't make any difference. Oh, you're a cheerful soul. I say, how did you know they'd try it tonight? I didn't. But it's been eight days since the last one. It's the first foggy night since then. Oh, just a hunch. Oh. 
Well, you think we can catch them? Oh, no. Try, though. You like machine guns? <laughs> if I'm behind them, I don't mind. <laughs> Always have one aboard for emergencies. Might have to use it. Ah, uh, just like the old days, hmm? Uh, rather. Peters and I told Peter to German patrol boat in an MTB. <laughs> Nothing like it. Ah, uh-huh. except an office at the yard. Oh, sedentary swine. Look out! Oh, that was close, wasn't it? I wish this ruddy fog would lift. Yeah, so do I. But it didn't. We kept on. The same incredible speed. Trevelyan must have known the river by heart. He had to because I know he could barely see it. The pirate boat was somewhere in front of us and we rolled and slapped in his wake. TD2 passed the divisional base at Wapping, Tower Bridge, London Bridge, Waterloo. Once we thought we saw a dark shape ahead as the fog cleared for a moment, but it quickly closed in again. We were rowing onto Putney Bridge when Peters brought a wireless message. Message from Wapping, sir. Huh? Oh, look, sir. One of the launches saw him go by, but he was too fast for him. Uh, he's too fast for us, too. If that isn't a converted thornic craft, I'll eat it. Well, how far do you think he'll run? Uh, who knows? He can't hide one of those things very well. We're bound to spot it sooner or later. My dear old thing, we've known for at least six months that they're using a boat. No one's ever seen it. Now we have. But if we give them 24 hours, they can change the line so that you'll look like a houseboat. Oh, why don't you and Sergeant Moffat hop up to the bow with a gun? If you see anything, have a pot at it. Oh, charming fellow. You're safe behind the wheel, they shoot back and we get it. <laughs> exactly. It'll give you something to think about, eh? Peter, bring out a couple of reefer jackets. Aye, sir. Can't have overcoats and bowlers on my ship, Black. <laughs> Make a seaman of you yet. I doubt it. Moffat doubts it, too. Look at him. By the time we reached Q, there was no longer any sign of our quarry's wake. Trevelyan was forced to slow down when a tug furiously screamed a warning and literally scraped by, dragging a string of small barges. Across deep, the fog lifted a bit, enough so that we could see only darkness ahead of us. There was no sign of the pirate. All right, they've sewn themselves up. We'll get them now. How? Teddington Locks ahead. You can see the light. It's like a blind alley for them. Well, they might try to double back. Well, they won't get far if they do. See any signs of them, Peters? No, sir, not yet. Well, keep a sharp lookout. Aye, sir. I say. Yes? The locks. Don't they look rusty? Lost. Why, they're open. What the devil's the matter with those fools? Well, you think they didn't get the message? Why, of course they did. Somebody's going to roast for this. Peters! Stand by with the bow line. We're going to run in for a minute. Right, sir. Uh, not much use going on, eh? Uh, they must have better than a half mile lead on us. Oh, double block. Half speed, Macintosh. Aye, sir. Next block's at Hampton Court. We'll signal ahead to close them. Ah, what filthy luck. Yes. And then I want to have a little talk with the gentleman in charge of the locks here. Not going to be so easy now. Why, well, there's a hundred places for them to hide along the river, even if we catch them before Hampton Court. You know, they might have pulled into shore before they even got here. Doubtful we could have seen them in that fog. Yes, I know. Huh. Now, where the devil's that locks, master? Hello! Say, you smell something. Huh? Oh, yeah. Cordite? Cordite. Well, good Lord, look. Oh. Uh, he's not dead that he's not going to wake up for a long time. They must have found the locks closed. Came up here, forced him to open them, and... Oh, the poor devil. Well, I'll have Peters get him some help. Yes, and send out a general alarm. Cover the river from here up to Oxford. Now, what about Hampton Court locks? I have wireless for a police guard. That is, if they haven't already got through. Oh, they couldn't. And as far as we could determine, some hour or so later, they hadn't passed beyond Hampton Court. Now, except for the River Mole, which emptied into the Thames, we had approximately ten miles of river to search. Somewhere between the Teddington Lock and Hampton Court, there was a powerful motor launch, equipped with machine guns 
and carrying a crew whom we now knew might not stop at murder. The one thing over which we had little control was the possibility that they would abandon the boat and escape by road. So I ordered a cordon set up on both sides of the river with the hope that we might forestall such an effort. It was going to be a long night. And so when we docked again to take another machine gun aboard, I made a phone call. Hello? Hello, Anne. Peter. Oh, you. I just cried myself to sleep. Where are you? Uh, uh, Teddington, on the river. Now, what are you doing there? Looking for pirates. Very funny. No, it isn't, Anne. They've almost killed a man. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, Peter. I thought I might be able to drop by for a moment or two tonight, but... Oh, it's all right. Take care of yourself, won't you? Yes. We'll make it tomorrow night, okay? Yes, I'd love to. I miss you. Call me in the morning, huh? Good night, Peter. Good night. Well, you ready? Yes, I'm coming. Coffee, sir? Huh? Oh, thank you. You, sir? Oh, thanks, Peter. Sergeant? Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> it might settle you, Moffitt. That's what I'm afraid of, sir. For good and all. Hello, what's that? McIntosh, get the search back on it. You just passed something. Oh, I see, sir. Could be the same one. Hard to tell. No, no, I know. She's anchored stern on. Let's have a look. Oh, take that gun on the bow, Peter. Right, sir. Keep the search steady on her, McIntosh. What do you think? Well, same lines, all right. Of course, there's more than one converted MTB on the river. Yeah. You want me to hop over with the line? No, yeah, will you? We'll keep you covered from here. All right, kind of you. Close enough. In a sec. All serene. Uh, fish. Anybody aboard? Oh, cabin board. Oh, these decks haven't been scrubbed in a month of Sundays. Well, they could have rowed to shore if they carry a dinghy. Oh, there's something funny about her. Should carry lights anchored in midstream. Yes. the devil's the switch. Uh, wait a minute. I, I got a torch. Don't turn it on and don't turn around. Now, drop your guns. I said drop them. All right. Now, we're going to have a little talk. If anybody raises his voice, he's going to be killed. The Valian and I stood in the darkened cabin and under us the boat swayed in the current. For a moment, it was just that. And then, a light glowed. And in it, I saw the figure of a man, his hands cupping the bow, allowing only a glimmer to see through. There were four men, two holding Tommy guns. They'd come from a cubicle behind us. Pick up the guns, Ted. First, the blokes on your launch, Copper. Tell them to clear out. How am I going to do that? Anywhere you want. Well, they won't do it, you know. They better. You can't get away. What's the odds? No more jabber. You, you're the skipper. Get your head up there and tell him to cast off. Your pal can stay down here. Say the wrong thing and I'm going to shoot him. <coughs> get up, Tick. All right. Here, move on. Now say the right thing. Get me? Well, Black, you better do it. Peter! Aye, sir. Uh, Inspector Black. Want the fingerprint man to come out. Aye, sir. Take the boat back to Teddington. Bring a man back with you. Right, sir. You staying aboard? Yes. Shall I send Sergeant Moffitt over? Uh, no, no, he can stay with you. Very good, sir. That's enough. Get back down here. Oh, 
bulb's getting hot. Don't need to cover it anymore, do we? No. Uh, what do we want to keep them with us? Maybe enough thunder, blizzard, and trouble. <coughs> That's what I say, ain't we? Shut up, Pitch. If you'd attend to the motor instead of laying around pottied half the time, we wouldn't have broken down. Shut up. <coughs> you coppers wouldn't have found us, you know that. Just bad luck. Motor conking out. I suppose you realize there may be a murder charge now. If the thing is... Fifteen minutes. Yes. Sit down, both of you. Listen to me. You're our passport, see? We're going to make a run down river. If any locks are closed or we're stopped, it's up to you. Get me? Yes. But the whole police force is out. When it gets light... When it gets light, we'll start worrying. Meantime... You can worry if you try anything funny. They tied us up, threw us on a couple of bunks, then went up on deck. We could hear the sounds of repairs going on. It would take the police launch at least an hour or more before it returned. And in the meantime, Trevelyan and I were in a rather awkward position. <laughs> oh, come on, Trevelyan, no aesthetics. <laughs> you know what you look like. What? <laughs> a turkey, all ready for the oven. Oh, that's... Oh, <laughs> yes, I see what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we're a couple of prize idiots walking into a trap like that. Uh, can't move an inch. Can you? No. This is serious. Oh, really? Well, I mean, what are we going to do? Be brave, get killed? Not if I can help it. I've got a date tomorrow night. I'd rather like to keep it. You? Oh, celebrate a woman? Oh, wonder what. Uh, uh, wait a sec. Hmm? There's, there's something sharp behind the bunk. I'm, I'm trying to... Yeah, it feels like a tobacco can or something jammed in. Oh, any luck? Huh? Not yet. Ow, blast. Oh, never mind the blood. Get those ropes off. Oh, funny fellow. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. That's torn it. Sounds as if they're... Oh, what's the good word? It's cutting through. Yeah, mostly me, but... Fine time to think about it, but uh, you got any bright ideas about what we do once we are out? We got guns, you know. Yes, I know. Oh, come on, get a move on, can't you? Well, Houdini could have done it in half the time. I thought when you were in the commanders, they'd torture you about those Oh, suck it. Ah! Oh, good man. Oh, Oh, that wasn't a tobacco tin. A loose razor. Oh, no wonder. Hot pigs. <laughs> no sense of humor, you CID boy. Oh, will you turn over so that I can get at your hands? Right. Yes, sir. Using the razor blade? Yes, I am. Do you feel it? Ouch! Oh, you did that on purpose. Oh, what a thought. Ah, uh, there. Now your feet. Ah. Whew. Oh, my fingers feel like a bunch of bananas. That's better. There we are. Ah, what now? Well, we find something to, uh... Ah. Oh, one for you, and one for me. Ha, 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 jolly. I say, I saw an American film last week. Chap broke a bottle on the bar and went for the other bloke. Oh, what a mess. <laughs> uh, shall we? Uh, no, break it on my head. It's more sporting. <laughs> Behind the door. Let them get in first. Right you are. <coughs> it didn't break. The gun. No sooner said the dust. Kitch! Hurry, Kitch! Hurry up! Now, we've got to be careful. The wheel faces the cabin door. Whoever's there will be bound to see us as we come up and shoot first. No, I'd rather not. We've got a couple of machine guns, you know. I know. Um, no, no, wait a bit. They'll come looking for Mr. Ketch here, uh -huh. and we can get them one at a time. Oh, right. Ketch! Ketch! Better go down there. He's probably found a bottle. Right. Here we are. Hello. Close your mouth or I'll blow your ears off. Good. Yeah. No gun. No gun. Oh, well, put him away. 
<laughs> I say we are heroic tonight, aren't we? Oh, you haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> These boys are even sillier than we were. <laughs> well, oh, that's a little more even now. Only two of them up there. Come on, close the door behind you. I'll take the chap at the wheel. Right. Eh? <laughs> well, I, I suppose we'd better turn this thing around and uh, haul out the flotsam. That's your job, Trevelyan. <laughs> the four would-be pirates had disguised the boat as a fisherman. And with alarming ease, combined with tremendous luck, they managed to carry out their series of robberies. The locks master recovered from his injuries, and the men received long sentences for armed robberies. The night following their arrest, I kept my date with... Miss Anne Crawford. Pursuit. And the pursuit is ended. Unit Moffat. Featured in tonight's cast were Joseph Kearns, Mary Jane Croft, Dan O'Herlihy, Lou Krugman, Tudor Owen, William Johnstone, and Charles Davis. We invite you to join us next week at this same time when Pursuit will bring you another dramatic story of the famous inspector Peter Black of Scotland Yard, relentlessly hunting down those whose disordered passions breed violence and murder. Another story of man hunting man when we bring you Pursuit. Pursuit, starring Ben Wright as the famous inspector Peter Black of Scotland Yard, has been a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.